Um, shall we just pray, and then we'll, um, we'll start. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Yes, I just want to pray that you would be encouraged by this word. That's my heart in writing it, be encouraged. So just be ready for encouragement. Be open to the Lord encouraging you. Be open to the Spirit touching you. It's one touch from the encourager is all it takes. So wherever you are at, even if what I'm speaking about is not specifically relevant to the thing that you need encouragement about, receive it because the Lord is pouring out encouragement this morning. He's doing it because I've asked him to and he's lovely. So just be encouraged, love on him, just receive his love and return it back to him, okay? Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Amen. So I want to speak to you today about enjoying the Lord. And um, uh, it's going to, um, you know, the last three weeks we've looked at some quite chunky theology, haven't we? Um, pressing the envelope, stretching the boundaries maybe of, of our experience and stuff. And that is, um, that's been really great. This is going to feel like a very simple sermon, but I want to tell you that it, don't be fooled by its simplicity. Um, I'm going to talk about something that is absolutely essential. It's core. It's literally everything. That is that we enjoy the Lord, that we enjoy him. You know, even as we come to terms with the news of Graham's passing, I want to talk to you about joy. And I'm going to look at a load of um, scriptures this morning, and in each one I want us to reflect on what it is to enjoy the Lord, what it does when we enjoy him, and what the Bible teaches us about how to enjoy him. So, as I say, it's going to sound simple, but enjoying the Lord is what Jesus bled for. If we don't enjoy him, we've misunderstood the cross because his sacrifice was the sacrifice of reconciliation between God and humans, that we would find pleasure in each other again. A.W. Tozer said, God made us for himself that we might know him, live with him, and enjoy him forever. I'm going to hit a load of scriptures no point in looking them up. They'll hopefully appear on the screen. This is 1 John 4, 9. It says this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. The word live there literally means to enjoy true life. So the true life that we were made to live, we live only through Jesus, and that life is marked by enjoyment. So 1 John 4, 9 basically means we live by him through enjoying him. I'm going to say something, and I'm now not going to. Good. How do you know that you are making progress with God? Your enjoyment of him is increasing and increasing. When your enjoyment of the Lord is suffering, that is a sign that your spiritual life is suffering, okay? So you can gauge where you are in your relationship with Jesus by how much you are enjoying him. You can gauge where a church is by how much its people are enjoying Jesus. Ministry is meant to be an expression of our enjoyment of the Lord, Right? So if ministry becomes anything other than an expression of our personal and corporate enjoyment of the Lord, then we are missing what ministry is. And worse, we are misrepresenting the Christian life. The inflow is meant to be enjoyment that overflows to others. Joy is contagious. The point of this whole thing is enjoying the Lord. How is it that I've been to so many places where the Christians just look miserable? What witness is it to be miserable about the Lord of life? Philippians 3.1, Paul shows us the new life in Jesus that defines the new covenant. He says, further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. And then in Philippians 4.4, 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The word rejoice in both those verses is interesting. I think I've got a slide here, Jenny. It should be number one. The word is um, karate, 
which is translated here as rejoice, right? But it's also translated as hail, as in a greeting. So in Matthew 28, 9, the women leave the empty tomb on Easter Sunday, and then they encounter Jesus alive in the garden, and the first word he speaks to them is karate, which in that verse is, is translated as greetings, that's what it says in the NIV. Suddenly, Jesus met them, it says, greetings, he said. But that's an impoverished translation. What he's actually saying is, rejoice. First word to them. And it makes sense because the verse just before it says, so the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. And then note what happens after he speaks the word rejoice. It says in verse 9, it says this, they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. What's my point? The first and proper response to an experience of the risen Lord is joy. Thank you. Amen. He's risen. From now on, rejoice, be full of joy forever. It's the mark of the new covenant that our enjoyment of Jesus and his enjoyment of us is restored permanently. That's why Paul says, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. In other words, all the time for all time. The word rejoice literally means to take, to take joy out of something or someone, right? Or like to, to, pull, to pull joy out of a person. C.S. Lewis said, God doesn't give joy, he is joy. Wow. Joy is receiving the person of Christ as your joy. When Paul says rejoice in the Lord, he's literally saying, take Christ as your joy. In other words, enjoy him. Enjoy the Lord. Enjoy him. Psalm 1, David says this, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. What does David mean by delighting in the law of the Lord? To him, the law cannot be separated from the Lord himself, right? He calls the law the law of your mouth. In other words, it came from the lips of the one that he loves. He doesn't love ink on parchment. He loves the lips that spoke the words. And so the words, are, they're not just precious to him. They are his delight. If you struggle to read the Bible, can I suggest a change of tack? Don't try to be more disciplined in your Bible study. Instead, learn to delight in the Lord. It will completely change your relationship with the word. So David says in Psalm 1, this is Psalm 1, 1 to 3, he says this, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. So what David is saying is that enjoying Jesus makes us fruitful in every season. In the midst of difficult circumstances, the difference between those who fall away and those who overcome is that the overcomers, the ones that David says, he describes them as evergreen and fruitful, they're the ones that delight in the Lord, who take their joy in the Lord. Right, So notice again how the true Christian life is not orientated around us or our circumstances. When we make it so, we grumble and complain and faith dies. But when we orientate to the one who died and rose again, then faith flies because he is our joy. Faith always grows when it's watered with delight. Faith grows when it's watered with delight. And of course we have trial and tribulation. But nothing can kill the faith of the evergreens who delight in God. No matter what storms hit us, the anchor is found in enjoying the Lord. When Jules and I um, received the terrible news last year, 
that her cousin had died in that plane crash in Nepal. 34 years old, just got engaged. We wept. And um, if we're honest, we still cry at times. But two days after hearing that news, I um, walked into church to lead one of our revival prayer meetings. And I, I was fragile and grieving, but despite that, my first instinct was to worship. Not as a crutch. It wasn't because I didn't know what else to do. It was because it was the only thing I wanted to do. To go straight to the place of delight, to enjoy the Lord and do what the women did in the garden, just to sit at his feet and worship and draw near to him and to touch joy himself. So many retreat from the Lord in hardship, run to his feet and enjoy him. That's been the atmosphere every time I've visited Chris and Graham recently. Look to them in this season. You will see the impact of what it means to treasure and delight in the Lord. Circumstances cannot affect our greenness when we delight in him. We must understand, as David did, that joy does not come from circumstances. It comes from communion. Deep delight. Okay, this is Psalm 36, 5 to 9. One of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the high mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. What's David's point? What's he pointing at? He's pointing at delight. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. And in your light we see light. Joy is walking in the light of his countenance. This just came to me. I just need someone to beatbox here. Face-to-face -face releases the grace to encounter the treasure who gives us pleasure. Is that beatboxing? No? Okay. Why am I looking at Jay's 30? <laughs> you're 30, mate. You're 30. Round it, always round it up. Jules is nearly 50. I'm still 40. That's how you round up things. <laughs> What is the river of delights? Think of it as the flow of life springing forth from Jesus himself. Genesis 2 talks about Eden, and it says, In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then it says, A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. The Passion Translation puts it like this. Flowing from the land of delight was a river to water the garden. Other translations speak of the river called delight. What does Eden mean? Jenny, another slide if you don't mind. Eden means paradise, pleasure, bliss, or delight. And we've noted before, that means that we were created for delight and to delight. He placed us in the garden of his pleasure, which is watered by his delight. That's ground zero for your relationship with the Lord. Our createdness is defined by enjoyment. And the enemy's primary objective from the beginning of time has been to rob us of our joy. He's wanted to take us out of Eden, the place of pleasure and bliss. You want to resist the devil? You want to kill his influence in your life? Delight in the Lord. Jumping to the other end of the Bible in Revelation, John speaks of the river of God which flows from under his throne. Underneath his rule flows the river of life. Submit to his authority and you will access the river of life, the river of delight, which is joy. And these are spiritual laws that activate a reality in the life of a Christian. The river of delight is Jesus himself giving you himself. This is God's restoration of enjoyment, pleasure of one another. It's the gospel. That's the gospel. Return to joy is the gospel. Jesus opened up a new and living way. 
by that we could enjoy God again. What did Adam lose in the garden? His enjoyment of God. That's what was lost. Enjoyment was replaced by work, striving, and shame. These things are the opposite of joy. Shame is the opposite of joy. Joy is walking in the light of his, his countenance. It's, it's the return to Eden. It's saying no to the shadows and exposing everything to the Lord again. Understand that walking in the light doesn't mean that you're living perfect. Walking in the light means hiding nothing from the Lord. Wow. And as we expose ourselves to him, literally uncovering our shame, we rediscover what it is to delight in the Lord and enjoy him fully. That's the wrong slide just yet, Jenny. Just everyone looked to the screens there. I was like, what's going on? That's what Jesus came back to give us. Okay, Psalm 94, Jenny, it should be there. I'm still talking about enjoying the Lord, okay? What it is, what it does, and how to do it. Psalm 94, 19 says, When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. Listen, the epidemic of anxiety in our society today is demonic. Don't agree with it. Don't agree with the narratives. Don't agree that it's inevitable. Don't define anyone by anxiety ever. <clears throat> I'm not saying that you are demonized if you're anxious, nor am I devaluing or discounting it, over-spiritualizing it, or telling you to snap out of it. Anxiety is real. But what I am doing is that I'm calling out that there is an assignment from the enemy, particularly in the younger generations, to rob them of their joy. So youth, listen up. Young adults, listen up. And Jay, listen up, because you're kind of in between. <laughs> Take heart. Take heart. There is a way out. It's his consolation, his comfort. And it's accessed by turning to him and with no strings attached, simply enjoying him. The root out of anxiety is to enjoy the Lord. It's to delight in him. David's revealing a deep understanding of faith and the human condition. He's saying that anxiety is the opposite of enjoyment, which means that there are two truths in this psalm. Anxiety kills enjoyment, but it's also true that enjoyment kills anxiety. So press into enjoyment of the Lord when you feel anxious because it's in enjoying the Lord that you will return to joy. That's what Jesus died for. Jesus died that we would have an inheritance, says in the Bible. What's our inheritance? Isaiah 61, 7, it says this. Instead of your shame, which we've just noted is the opposite of enjoying the Lord, you will receive a double portion, and instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. What is our inheritance? It's everlasting joy. The reconciliation of God and man, the internal enjoyment that comes from mutual delight. Can you see how the word is constantly encouraging us to delight in the Lord and enjoy him? This is Proverbs 23, 26. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my ways. Two things going on here. One, the giving of your heart. Two, delighting in his ways. Notice the order. The giving of your heart is first. The delighting is second. Giving your heart is the way to knowing the delight of the Lord. So as we think about how to delight in the Lord, understand that with everything else, delight is a heart issue. It's a heart issue. Who has your heart? If something else has your heart, you can't delight in the Lord. Elsewhere, Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. My question is, is Christ your treasure? If the answer is yes, then he also has your heart. But if Jesus is not your treasure, then he does not have your heart. And if you haven't given him your heart, you won't ever know what it is to enjoy him and delight in him, commune with him, unhindered by the distortions of religion and pride. 
What is it that the Lord has said himself that he wants most from us? That we would love the Lord our God with all of our hearts. Why? Because he's made it so that the giving of the heart in affection and devotion and love opens up to us the fullness of joy that comes from the person of Jesus. He's after hearts that are completely his. Give your heart to the Lord and you enter the delight of the Lord. Understand, when I say give your heart, I don't mean become a Christian. I mean give him your heart. There are lots of Christians who haven't given him their heart. Last one. Isaiah 58, 13 to 14 says this. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord and I will cause you to ride in triumph in the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Have you read that passage before? Wow, can I read it one more time? I'm gonna do it with emphasis. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please, or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Wow. Speaking about the Sabbath, this little passage is packed full of spiritual laws. Let me paraphrase. If you turn away from seeking your own pleasure, then you will take delight in the Lord and he will give you your inheritance, which we have noted is joy. Look again, there's more. If you turn from your own desires and turn towards him, then he will make you delight in him and in delighting in him, it says, he will take you up to higher places where you will feast on joy. Wow. If you were here last week, you might remember that we talked about how delighting in the Lord and having desire for the Lord is a key to heaven encounters. And here in the ancient texts of Isaiah, 700 years before the coming of the one who went before us to make a way, we find the same promise, that there is an access point to heavenly pasture, and it is delight in Jesus. Who doesn't want that life? Why, why would we not want to feast on the joy of our inheritance? And know what it is to have a faith marked by the enjoyment of the Lord. Just me. I'm trying to tell you that enjoying him is it. It's literally it. How many of you, sorry, hands up moment, don't look around. How many of you would say that your, your faith is marked by enjoyment of the Lord, that you enjoy him? Don't be ashamed of it. Get your hands up. I mean, this is the thing, right? Thank you. Bless you. I never, it's never like a, um, that's, it's not like a census or a survey. St. Philip's says 25% of people who enjoy the Lord. It's just look around, right? It's possible. And it really ought to be how we are. Like I always say, religion makes people miserable, but the Lord just, I mean, it's just, it's crazy fun. He is delightful and delicious. Have you ever got the giggles um, when someone else is laughing and you either didn't hear what made them laugh or you didn't get it, but you're giggling because they're giggling. I love that. Jules' mum is amazing at that. When Jules does it, I think about three times in the last 25 years, but when it happens... <laughs> It's insane. We love it. Everything stops in our house just to giggle with jewels. <laughs> uh, where was I? All encounter, all transformation, anything that you would want to attain 
in your relationship with Jesus, the shaping of your character, the healing of all of your pain, everything comes from enjoying the Lord. Enjoying him is the root to the fruit, right? It really is. Now, you might say to me, I'm trying to be more patient, but patience isn't something, for example. Patience isn't something that you can work up. It's a fruit of enjoyment. So rather than praying, Lord, help me to be more patient, instead just go deeper into the enjoyment of the Lord, and he will be patient through you. That's why he uses the word fruit to destroy works, because works can never produce fruit. Christians think they have to work stuff up all the time. They didn't realize all they had to do was enjoy Jesus. It says that works are under a curse. Jesus cursed the fig tree so that it wouldn't bear fruit. Fruit cannot come from a curse. Jesus said good fruit can't come from bad trees and bad fruit can't come from good trees. Works can never produce fruit. So the word fruit is used to show that it's an effortless result of enjoying the Lord. Galatians 5 even tells us it's not even our fruit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And it manifests through you, not by works or law, but by grace and communion. Enjoying him is the root to every fruit. Elsewhere, Jesus says, bearing fruit glorifies God. To glorify him, you need fruit. If you need fruit to glorify God, then to produce the fruit, you need life. Because dead trees can't produce fruit. It's life that causes a branch to produce. And to have life, you need enjoyment. Blessed is the one who delights in the Lord... Such a person is like a tree planted by streams of living water, which yields its fruit in season. Whatever they do prospers. So as you enjoy God, you receive the life of God. And as you receive the life of God, you bring forth fruit. And as you bring forth fruit, you glorify God. It is in delighting that we bear fruit. This thing is all about this, to glorify God by enjoying him forever. Make the switch if you need to. It will transform your faith and your life. Amen. That's me trying to do a short sermon. I prefer long ones. It's not natural for me. It's like trying to breathe underwater. Could the band come up, please? We have to finish in a few minutes. But I want to encourage you to delight in the Lord. You know, everything we talk about here is trying to encourage you, edify you, and bring you to maturity. And the thing is, what I've said before, I keep discovering, the the simpler I go, the deeper I go. I'm not saying, check out your brain. Of course not. But I am saying that wisdom is taking him at his word. You don't need to complicate his word. It says, enjoy him. So shall we just take a few minutes to practice enjoying the Lord? Those of you who do it already, crack on. Those of you who don't sit down and just enjoy him, we're going to do it right now. Okay? So do whatever you want, but I can tend to close my eyes. And I put a smile on my face. Because he's shown me, even in the last 12 months, that smiling at him blesses him. And when he's blessed, I feel his pleasure. And it makes me smile. When we live in the light, as I said, we don't live in shame. You cannot smile at the Lord if you feel shame. But when you know you're shame-free, out comes the smile. So just turn everything about yourself towards him right now. Hide nothing from him. Hide nothing from him. We're going to wrap up in a few minutes, but just for a couple of minutes, hide nothing from him. What are you hiding anyway? He sees it all and he loves you so much. Lord Jesus, precious Savior to me, I delight in you. I used to think you were far off, And I used to feel shame, and I used to hide myself and try and ingratiate myself to you. But you showed me the Father's heart, 
And now I just delight in you. As he delights in me, you've returned me to Eden, the place of your pleasure, your delight. You've brought me into the land of bliss where I can drink from the river of life, where there is no pressure to produce anything but just to enjoy you. So I enjoy you right now, Jesus. This doesn't have to be complicated. I just enjoy you. You've never let me down, not once. You're not disappointed in me. You have approved of me because of the righteousness of your son. No one is perfect but the risen lamb. But we've been clothed in his righteousness. Adam and Eve covered themselves with fig leaves. We've been covered in Christ. <laughs> you are my joy. You are my joy and my delight. <laughs> See, when you practice this, you giggle really quickly. You are my joy and my delight. I would have been too embarrassed to do this 10 years ago. Now I don't care because he is so much fun. You are my joy and my delight. Wow. <laughs> Just smile at him. Put a smile on your face. Do it in the flesh if you need to, but the Spirit will fill it. Just like you have to use your voice to speak in tongues, sometimes you've got to smile to be filled with joy. Hey, you are my joy. You are my joy and my delight. Make this how you relate to him. You are my joy and my delight. Make that how you relate to him. Delight in the Lord. Delight in the Lord. Enjoy him. His blood means you can enjoy him. His broken body means you can enjoy him. His cross means that you can enjoy him. His resurrection means that you can enjoy him. His ascension to the high throne of heaven means that you get to enjoy him. <laughs> <laughs>